Hi everyone. We here, Vlad as well. Um, just uh, first of all, say hi in the chat so we know that you can actually hear us. We're going to give it 10, 15 seconds because there is latency. We're getting better at this so we kind of know <laughs> what to expect, sort of. Let's see on Discord. Good. Okay, you see that John's can hear. It's a little soft, maybe, uh, but legible. Okay, uh, let me see if I can check, 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 check. Hopefully, you can hear me now better. Um, Vlad, maybe you can what also about talk me? a little bit. What about me? Should I put it higher, lower? Okay, we can get started, and if you guys uh, can't hear us properly, or maybe the synth that is playing, please let me know, and I can adjust it um, while Vlad is uh, speaking. Uh, so, yeah, Synthiex Academy, Roy here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today, Vlad is going to be uh, explaining how to create an arpeggiator uh, on the Daisy Seed. And um, to people who don't know uh, the, the Academy, uh, we're a nonprofit. We create all sorts of activities and um, instruments or kits uh, to allow uh, musicians and makers to get started with synth DIY and also for professionals who want to uh, create uh, prototypes faster. Um, the workshops that we started, uh, I think this is the sixth one that we have. Um, are with uh, Vlad and with Nick. These are both uh, professional engineers from our community. Um, so uh, uh, it's super nice to see that we can actually develop further and it's uh, not only me teaching, but a lot of other people are now joining to teach as well. Um, yeah, uh, uh, if you want to support the Academy, you can uh, either buy a kit or maybe at a certain point we'll start um, uh, some sort of a subscription model but at the moment uh, the only way to support the academy is um, uh, to just buy one of the kits um, and um, yeah uh, to people who don't know Vlad, Vlad uh, and I started working about a year and a half ago on the um, uh, uh, Spoticutch uh, dual sampler and um, it's a fantastic uh, product that is using C++ um, and uh, the, the Daisy Seed, where you actually have two um, uh, samplers playing at the same time. Um, and uh, um, you could, yeah, maybe, maybe that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a, bad, a bad introduction for, for this really cool instrument, but I don't have a way to share it. So um, you can go to the website and, and see it there. It's on, on the homepage, you can see the three instruments that we released and Vlad is one of the guys who made one of the instruments, the simpler one that's called Spotikach. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll let uh, Vlad continue from here. Uh, yeah, Vlad takes the stage. Yeah, thank you. So, um, hello everyone. And uh, yeah, as Roy already mentioned, uh, today we are talking about Arpeggiator. And uh, probably we let's just start with uh, straight from demo of what we what we will be talking about so here i guess you can see it right um so it's built uh basing on a simple fix board so here i have uh, as usual three knobs and the switch and the audio output and if i turn it on you should hear it Probably let me know if it's too hot. And it is. It is quite uh, like com in comparison to your microphone. This is really, really high. Really high. Okay. Let me put it lower. 
better now? Yeah, that's better. Okay, so the first knob uh, controls the controls the uh, speed. The second knob works more or less like a, like a input, like selects actually the notes. And the third one uh, serves for uh, uh, changing direction and also for randomization of the of the uh, of the sequence. So if I turn it, it starts like randomizing it, and then on the other side, it already it's again not random, but it's in opposite direction. Yeah, so it's it was forward, now it's backward, and. Yeah, so I call it philosophical arpeggiator. You go from order three through chaos to another order and back. And yeah, so that's uh, that's the instrument. That uh, that what I came up with for uh, today's workshop. And yeah, let's uh, look uh, what uh, what building blocks are there. So how it's uh, built, what it consists of, and um, so let's start with some slides. So everything starts with a uh, with an input, yeah. So some keyboard or maybe it's uh, some uh, launchpad or whatever, whatever else, and then we need some module that converts the note numbers two frequencies yeah and then eventually this goes to actually uh, actual oscillator and produces some sound so arpeggiator is a modifier yeah so it doesn't produce uh, anything itself more or less it just modifies what we put there so it stands in between uh, input and uh, uh, the sound sound engine and um, in this uh, in this particular project I um, made it that it uh, I used a lot uh, like concepts from MIDI so uh, when we like press a note it's not a press a note it's just a turn of a knob yeah it sends not on and it sends not off when it when it should stop so this uh, like MIDI protocol uh, is uh, like concept of this protocol is implemented here, uh, and um, also what we uh, what we send here uh, is uh, note number and velocity. Also as a like what what you have if you if you do MIDI, and of course uh, we need some clock to drive uh, to drive this arpeggiator. And uh, in the code, every block is actually represented by separated uh, separate class. So we have class terminal, which is this input, which is controlled by second knob, which changes nodes. We have class arpeggiator, where all this uh, magic happening. Then we have uh, class scale, which actually maps the node numbers to frequencies. We have vox, which is oscillator with, uh, it's actually a mix of oscillator, uh, LFO, and uh, envelope. And we are uh, using here Metro. Metro is a part of uh, DAISY SP. Uh, it's a really simple clock that uh, generates uh, impulses at uh, a given frequency. And um, so we will go one by one through those, through those modules. And uh, I will show you, like explain concepts behind it and also, uh, also show in the code how it actually implemented. So, uh, one thing that I want to mention in 
in front of all this that this is not the uh, like definition of how this should be built. So it's one of millions ways how you can do it. So here doing this, I was uh, looking uh, for something that is like universal that can be then reused for something for some other uh, applications. So it's not only in this project, you can move it into another project and use it there. And also that I can, uh, with it, um, show some, some concepts, some particular concepts. Uh, so that's why in this case, this particular set of modules and this separation was, uh, was chosen, but it can be a little, it can vary. Yeah, it can be, uh, can be different. So, uh, let's start with uh, with a scale class because it's the simplest one from all those and uh, we can already get uh, some idea about some uh, concepts. But before that, one more thing is about actually communication between them. So as I mentioned, Terminal, Arpeggiator and uh, Sound Engine, they talk in terms of like MIDI protocol like MIDI-like protocol, yeah, like note on, note off. And uh, for this communication, I'm uh, using uh, callbacks. If you worked already with, uh, with, uh, with Daisy, you know already, uh, you already worked with callbacks. Uh, we have audio callbacks there. So here the concept is basically the same. So it's some function that is registered to be called uh, at some particular moment. And uh, in this case, uh, communicating with this, uh, with these callbacks, uh, first of all, it, um, like, it gives uh, convenience, it, uh, it's, it's more convenient to, to actually talk from, from uh, module to module. Also, it makes uh, this arpeggiator actually pluggable. Yeah, so I can Ideally, I can take it out and connect a note on from the terminal directly to the sound engine and it uh, should work. It will not work in this particular case because uh, uh, sound engine is monophonic. Yeah, so it can handle only one note at this point. So if you will try to put the, the uh, chord, it will just play one note of it. Uh, but otherwise that's... Uh, uh, it's possible, yeah. So if if you have polyphonic sound engine, and uh, Metro uh, talks to arpeggiator with uh, directly, so it just says arpeggiator trigger, and this trigger works. Uh, again, I took uh, MIDI uh, concept here. It uh, triggers it uh, twenty four times per quarter note, so uh, pulses per quarter note twenty four. Uh, so yeah. That's basically just overview. We will look into it with uh, more details, but uh, currently it's just an overview how all this thing is put together. So, yeah, now let's let's look at scale class first. So here it is, and um, it's really small, really simple. It, uh, uh, what scale does, uh, what's happening here, it just generates the array of frequencies. Uh, namely, it uh, uh, creates, uh, so I uh, first probably thing that you notice here is that there is, this, oh, there is this word template here. So it's a template class. Yeah, so it's uh, a bit, you probably, again, depending on how much you interacted with uh, Daisy SP, you've seen it already, particularly if you are using um, a delay line. Uh, usually you, when you instantiate this class, you have also this, uh, these brackets and there you s uh, put a type and the size of the, of the delay line. So here it's basically the same. And uh, what this template uh, means in this case is that the actual class that will be compiled then 
uh, depends on what uh, what will be put here as a parameter. Yeah, so this parameter is scale size. So if I when I create this class, if I put here, let's say, I put here something like forty eight or whatever, what does it mean? That at compile time it will just generate a class where all the places where scale size is mentioned will be replaced with the 48. And that's that's basically what, what's going to happen. Yes, so it's nothing um, extremely, uh, extremely advanced. You can see really advanced usages of these template classes, but the concept behind is this. Uh, in this case, I'm setting only the parameter, only the scale size, but it can be also type. Yeah, in this case, I don't need type. Why I'm using template here? Why, why I'm not setting the scale size just in initializer? It's because um, we are in uh, embedded environment, and here, uh, these classes, uh, we... Um, instantiate them statically and yeah, they're statically allocated which means that this size this scale size should be known at compile time to create this array for frequencies yeah so this is actually array of frequencies and we need to know the size at the moment when we compile it and the only way in this case so actually there are different ways but one of the ways how you can do it you can define this template here and put this scale size uh, here so that's that's how uh, and then it will generate this class and that's basically if you let's say instantiate another scale uh, class and put there another number it will generate one more class so that's why with this template classes especially in embedded environment you should be careful because uh, it will actually generate more code yeah in this case, it's not a problem. We have only one instance of this scale, so we don't, uh, we are not concerned with with this. But yeah, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, Vlad, just a yep. quick uh, quick question uh, from Ray. Um, why not just use uh, define? Uh, yeah, uh, I will. Um, I will explain this. It's a, it's a great question and. Uh, let me explain it a little bit later when we will be looking on the main file and how this scene assembled together. So there is a reason why why I'm uh, yeah. So when I said that there are many ways how you can do it, and you can the, one of these ways is really to use define. Yeah, you can you can just put define and that's it, or you can put. Uh, uh, create another header file and put the global variable and include it everywhere and use it everywhere. Yeah, so there are many ways. I uh, I would probably leave it for a little bit later and I will explain why I chosen here this way and not another. There is there are there is a reason for this. But thank you for the question. It's it's really really like to the point here. Uh, uh, yeah, so another concept that I want to, to show here, that's something that you don't see too much, probably is um, this kind of function. Yeah, so it has the same name as a, as a class itself, and it doesn't return any scene, and this scene is called constructor. So constructor is a function that called any time, uh, actually it called at the moment when you instantiate a class. Yeah, so when we just, uh, put uh, this uh, like uh, uh, static scale and uh, name of the variables that what's going to happen that's going to call this constructor there is actually counterpart to it uh, called uh, destructor it's uh, written the same scale but with tilde in front and in many cases we don't have it uh, in embed environment, we usually use this con uh, convenience, uh, conventional init. Yeah, and this init we are using in most cases to initialize um, uh, initialize objects because uh, first we need to initialize the hardware. Yeah, so usually if you look on setup method of the Arduino projects, first is uh, actually setup of the of the hardware itself, and then you initialize everything else because usually it relies on it. It relies on a, um, 
uh, sample rate, uh, memory should be initialized if you're using SDRAM, let's say. So, but in this case, uh, the scale doesn't rely on anything. Yeah, and it can be actually taken, easily taken out from this project and reused uh, in any other environment. So here I can actually do this initialization in the beginning, so it's uh, way more convenient. So, uh, yeah, what this thing is doing, it's, uh, again, nothing canonical here. I totally made it up. Uh, so it uh, how it generates the scale? It uh, uh, just... Uh, uses so-called, uh, also interesting term, uh, super particular ratios uh, to generate uh, like different frequencies. So what what are these super particular ratios? It's actually a ratio when uh, uh, number at, at the top, uh, one uh, higher than bottom. So two by one, three by two, five by four, and, and so on. And when you use this... Um, uh, this ratios to generate uh, generate intervals the most uh, probably uh, the most famous uh, scales that generated like this is uh, uh, Pythagorean uh, tuning yeah when it's uh, he was using the uh, two by one and three by two uh, another name of this tuning in three limit tuning because uh, the highest rate is three by two yes and three by two is actually perfect fifths. Yeah, it's actually, it's really perfect fifths. It's not what we have then uh, in the um, equally temperate scale, but it's actually this uh, uh, like pure interval. And um, so here I'm using uh, fifths and thirds. So I just do fifths, third, fifths, third, fifths, third. So I just mu multiply uh, by uh either by 1.5 or 1.25 yeah and if i exceed the frequency of 1500 1 and 5k which is somewhere at the range of six octave i just wrap it down until it falls uh, wrap it down octaves yeah i just divide it by 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 two yeah, until it falls down into the uh, into this range so that's how it's generated so there is uh, no it's it's not something like academical or something existing i just just used this concept and this concept is really interesting i really recommend you to read uh, about it at least on on wikipedia it's really uh, extensive article there about all these different tunics like three limit tuning five limit tuning different different uh, uh different flavors of it and it really gives interesting result so that's why when you when you was uh, when we were listening to the to the arpeggiator it was not just playing from top uh, from bottom to the top but uh closer to the top it was like playing a little bit back and forth it's because some frequencies like get got wrapped down so the frequency doesn't correspond to the note number yeah so uh but yeah you can put whatever that's yeah, a, yeah. Uh, uh, it's, it's actually really interesting and uh, um, DRMR and also me have the same question why did you start at frequency 36 there uh, at frequency 36 uh, you know it's uh, I guess it's just uh, uh, as far as I remember it's D D2 or D1 I don't remember exactly but uh, basically uh, this uh, this is more or less historical I uh, when I was doing the project for the first uh, first um, uh, workshop about um, uh, multi-voice drone I also started there from 36 and as far as I remember it was derived from the fact that a deep note was actually s starting at uh, at 36 and I just just took it and it, it just happened. So it can be any any frequency, right. any stuff. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So again, nothing canonical. It's yeah, just yeah, yeah. concept. I'm just showing the the concepts. Very cool. So yeah, um, and yeah, we have one method here. Take by uh, IDX, which is actually note number. Just give a frequency. That's it. Yeah. So that's all what it does. Okay. So the next. The next uh, one here is a terminal. And uh, 
terminal is also uh, like like a concept yeah it's not how you do it exactly it's like just an idea how it can be so uh, what what do i have here yeah so here actually at the top you can see how it's instantiated so the, the same as a scale and i have the scale size here uh, terminal depends on two already yeah it depends on nodes count so how many nodes will be in the court in this case it's 12 for whatever reason and 36 is actually the scale size yeah so how many nodes node numbers are there and how how this thing works it uh, generates like uh like a node numbers uh from 0 to 35 yeah and the top the top node the top voice of the of the arpeggiator of, of what gets from terminal to arpeggiator has range from 0 to 35 and all the rest just get stepped down by three in this case yeah it actually uh, how this will be formed depends on the ratio between nodes count and uh, scale size yeah and uh, basically then what's happening when you turn a knob when it's at zero every um, every node will be basically the same number it will be zero that's why if if the knob is on zero you will hear just one note pulsing pulsating yeah but then if you turn then it starts like uh, apply this uh, this value to the to the corresponding range, and because ranges are different, so they will uh, round to different positions. It gives like really different nodes. Yeah, so at the top position, it will be just just uh, the the final uh, the the higher, but in the middle, it will be something. Yeah, so it's it will actually check something. So that's how you can turn your knob into a keyboard. Yeah, and uh, of course here it's probably the most simple example. It all starts from zero. If it can be that you predefine it somehow that uh, every like every node starts at some different position and they somehow so you can some. A little bit like cheat on it, yes, yeah, so that it generates something that you that you want uh, it to generate. Uh, but yeah, in this case, I wanted to have something really simple and to see how how it works. Yeah, because when you you can define some like fixed scale, but it's to some extent can be uh, at some point become boring because you know what what is there one one hundred percent. Here, it's kind of a little bit unpredictable you you kind of control it but uh, how exactly this thing will react you never know and basically what's happening once uh, ev for every node once this change happens for every node it sends uh, node off and uh, node on for the new one yeah i will show you in in the code just in a moment yeah so let's look through the code of terminal yeah so uh, yeah the same here uh, I have uh, it's also template class with these two parameters as, uh, as I already mentioned uh, yeah and here actually because it's already talks uh, through these callbacks here actually uh, this uh, registration of callbacks happening so uh, callbacks themselves the variables that hold for uh, callbacks are uh, here at the bottom and uh, it's actually the syntax for this, uh, for this uh, pointer is uh, yeah a little bit uh, like unusual probably uh, so uh, first goes uh, what what this thing will return it's not always void it can be float if this callback returns something yeah like like a function yeah, so it's like like you define function. Uh, then uh, it's actually the name of the variable, and before this you have this asterisk, which says that this is pointer. And then you have the signature of the function. Actually, uh, defining the type, you don't even need this. Yeah, you don't need variable names here. Yeah, argument names. So what makes a function? What defines a function? It's actually 
uh, return type and types in the in the signature you know, type of arguments. So th th that's basically uh, what what defines the type of the function. But here I put this num and uh, velocity just for let's for to make it more clear what what those things are actually doing. And uh, so what uh, what this uh, those functions that register doing they just uh, take this they expect the pointer to be set there and it adjusts this po uh, sets this pointer assigns this pointer and holds it that's it yeah so nothing nothing more and then later it will use this uh, this pointer to call to call this callback and. Yeah, so uh, here uh, this thing that I just shown you on slides happening. Yeah, so it, it doesn't actually generate the, those ranges. It just works in these ranges. Yeah, so when I turn the knob, I'm um, uh, going through nodes count. I, it's always 12. Yeah, so it's this thing always uh, outputs uh, 12 nodes. Yeah, it cannot output less or more. So it's it's just 12. So first I send a node off with all the like old nodes and then I generate the new ones according to the rules that I just shown. So this thing does exactly this. And then for this new generated nodes I send a node on and a random velocity. You have between 70 and 127 so it just just sent something. Yeah, so it's to make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, yeah, so what this thing adds, uh, comparing to the scale, it adds this uh, callbacks already. And yeah, that's it basically about terminal itself. And uh, with this, we can go to the, uh, to the, uh, arpeggiator, I guess. Yes. And so arpeggiator, uh, basically, depending on what you put there, it's a pretty simple thing. Uh, the only, uh, the, the most, like, uh, probably the most complicated thing there in, in the arpeggiator is uh, that uh, when you play the note, it should capture it. Yeah, it captures it and then just repeats at, at some intervals, yeah, more or less. So it like captures your chord and then plays note by note. So it needs to make somehow skipping inside, some some bookkeeping of those notes, yeah, which note comes in, which note comes out, which note is after uh, so they should be somehow sorted by the by the number they should be uh, somehow you you need to know which note was played first which note was played last so all this uh, and there are um, probably different ways of doing it one of the ways that I uh, learned uh, recently from looking at mutable instruments code uh, it's uh, using so-called linked lists uh so i did it uh, like i did it completely my way so but the idea uh, it's really like really interesting so uh before going into into like workings of this like how, how this housekeeping of the inside arpeggiator works uh i want to like quickly ex explain what what linked list is in general so uh the link list is uh, like alternative uh, al alternative um kind of collection alternative to the array yeah so in array you have some indexes and some some values or some objects are sitting inside inside so, so it's continuous linked list is not continuous it it was supposed not to be continuous so uh, it's uh uh Link list is basically the the list where every element knows where the next one is. Yeah, so in array you go by index. Yeah, you kind of look outside. 
in linked list you ask the element okay where is your next neighbor is and you go to this next element and then you go to next element and uh, basically in the like original idea behind linked list it was like about dynamic uh, objects dynamic memory allocation something that we don't have um, we don't have here but, uh, so the the original idea is that okay we have one object we have another object somewhere sorry I need to drink a little bit we need another object in some different memory location so it's not sequential we have another object we have another object and then they connect between each other so if we want to if we want to it uh, iterate through this uh, collection we start with the first object then we ask okay where, where it has the pointer to the next one this can next one next one so this thing is called single linked list because there is only one link in one direction if there is link in another direction it's called already double linked list yeah so it knows not only where the pre next element but also where the previous is and if the last element is linked to the first element it's already called a circular list and those lists in many cases they also have so-called sentinel nodes so what a sentinel node is uh, something that the, uh, marks the beginning of the list let's say so you have a head you know that this is always so at least one element you always know where is it and then you then you go from it and continue so linked list where it's actually complete like complete um, uh, alternative to arrays and it's for dynamic memory allocation mostly so why are we using it here the most uh, uh, like linked list has one uh, interesting property when you insert an element at any position it's always uh, it's always like uh, there is uh, this measure uh, of a complexity you know, of, the, of the operation in computer science this all notion uh, which denotes more or less how many steps you need to to finish some algorithm or action and here uh, with linked list it's always like a uh, constant yeah so it doesn't matter at which position you insert a new element all what you need to do is just change those links yeah so you just break links between two elements you insert another one and you link link to it in array in classical array you cannot do it like i mean if you insert somewhere in in the middle first you need to like push uh, elements somehow to one one side which especially if you have some complex object if it's not just a float or something if it's some struct that contains something it can be a little bit expensive so um, in this case the, uh, the this property of linked list uh, makes it really convenient and uh, so what we are going to use here we are going to use actually hybrid of it it will be still sitting elements will be sitting in the array but they will like look on each other through those like next and previous references so we have like best from two worlds worlds yeah we can do this like insertion with a like constant complexity and also if we need to quickly iterate through him through them with indexes we still can do it because they are actually sitting inside the array container so yeah that's that's the idea so inside uh, inside the rpg uh, everything is starts with this uh, node struct and this uh, node struct uh, has um, node number velocity and then it has this next and previous yeah so one and this next and previous in classical list it's usually pointer actual pointer to the memory in this case it's not a pointer it's just the index in the array so where this guy will be sitting and we have two arrays so one array is actually nodes yeah in this case i put four 
just for for simplicity in uh, in the implementation it's i guess 16 but it can be any in fact and so here we have like four elements and every element is actually the struct node and second second one is uh, input order yeah so it's hard to to like maintain both in one collection so we split it into two yeah, so one uh, remembers which uh, uh, which node was played first so uh, always a node at uh, position zero will be like the least recent and uh, the last position it will be most recent um, so yeah that's basically the the idea here actually in uh, in uh, that code of mut from mutable instrument that I was looking it was actually opposite so linked list was used for like uh, input order and uh, usual array for sorting but yeah again you can do different so why they are different uh, different lengths so it's four nodes but three uh, because the first node will be actually the sentinel node so what uh, what will be this sentinel node it will have node number of 255 which uh, if if you take midi it's 127 uh, so 255 will be always always higher than any possible node and uh, we will use this uh, circumstance and it's linked to itself in the beginning uh, so when we have this empty array it's just linked to itself yeah so the next looks to to index zero previous to index zero so it's just more or less and <coughs> all the rest of this array is filled with empty uh, just empty nodes yeah so there is nothing there they are not linked anywhere they just and uh, there is a property bottom index which always uh, points to the to the lowest node according to uh, not index in the array but the node number actually actual node number so let's say we are playing the node 60 what's going to happen first it will look for for the free slot in this array and it will find immediately the third slot yeah of course so then it will just insert it there and uh, then happens the second phase it looks through the uh, through the uh, this list of nodes for the node that is higher than inserted one so something that is higher than 60 and in this case 255 is higher than 60 so algorithm will stop there and it will just link them together yeah so at this point uh, sentinel node uh, looks to element at one one looks to element to sentinel and in backward direction is the same yeah so they just just look on each other and the next step in input order it will put uh, this one so we know that uh, node at index one was played just now yeah so that's like the simplest yeah, the, the most basic scenario then let's now do you have any questions so far <laughs> because i guess i just yeah so okay. far it seems um the chat seems pretty quiet um guys feel free to ask anything if uh, things are not clear or if uh, we're going too deep too fast um yeah we're still trying to figure out what's the best um pace uh, for these topics uh, so we're going to take um, a second uh, to see if there are any questions, and if not, we're going to continue. Okay, let's uh, let's continue. Okay, so let's uh, just fast forward a little bit. And let's say we played a little bit already with it, and this is our current situation on the on the stack. Yeah, so we have uh, node fifty 
uh, at the last position, then we have 60, we have 70, and they linked to each other according to their uh, node numbers. So 50, uh, so bottom IDX is three, yeah, it's 50 here. And the next one will be 60, and the next one will be 70, next one will be Sentinel, and next one from Sentinel will be again, again three. And in opposite direction, it's more or less the same, yeah, from 50 back is Sentinel, and back is 70, back 60, back 50, and that's it. And uh, input order array tells us that first we have, we played node at position two, which was 60, then it's one, 70, and then three, 50. And uh, let's say... Uh, uh, Vlad, we, <laughs> it always surprised me how, how long we actually have um, uh, how how long of a buffer uh, and, and delay we have uh, with with YouTube? I do have a lot of messages now. Uh, some of them are questions. Some of them are just thank yous. Um, okay. So uh, uh, people seem to uh, follow uh, pretty well. There was a question from Neil who said that uh, he tried to use the code with the simple board, but um, there was a mismatch in the um, in the numbers. Um, Neil, uh, in general, you can always change these because um, the way that Vlad made the code is that at the top you have uh, define. Um, Vlad, maybe you can uh, show it there. So uh, it's yeah. Easy to uh, to, uh, to change mean, that. You uh, mean this define uh, over yeah. over pins? Yeah. Exactly. So, here. so so you can simply look at this and change it to the pins that you are actually using. Um, and on the um, simple fix board, these are uh, 30, 31, uh, uh, 32, 33, just like this. Um, I'm not sure why it didn't work for you. Maybe the uh, you're following the video that I made uh, and, and you placed the knobs or the, or, or the switches in a different way. But either way, you can always change that here. Um, in the code, Vlad used S30. So if on S30 you put, um, let's say, um, a knob, then you could change D15 to whatever A that you used, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's it's switch, but a knob actually can also work, I guess. Yeah, it will just have two positions. Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah, that's maybe a yeah, just, better. Yeah. Just. Oh, you have it on the daisy patch. Yeah, okay, on the daisy patch, that's a bit... Uh, trickier i guess yeah might might be trickier so there i i didn't work with it so far so yeah, yeah. it's it's a different board so you just need to uh, you need to assign it to whatever um uh, controllers you have there um okay some uh, other questions uh what is the input um what is the input the linked list is used for uh what is the link what is the input that the linked list is used for? Uh, the input is node, node number and node velocity. So we will look into, okay, I can show in the code. So here's a node on, uh, where you put number and velocity. And that's where all this dance starts. So it looks for a free slot. And so this is what, what I'm explaining now. It's actually uh, what's happening in uh, method node on. Yeah, so when when it gets input yeah, so how it gets inside the inside this linked list and uh, the node off will work similar but uh, a bit uh, a bit uh, simpler than yeah we need just to remove a node so that's uh, the input is actually what we will get from the from the terminal yeah from from nodes that that will be the input for the okay uh, cool um yeah uh, so yeah there are more uh should we be remind to capture all the context but i'm wondering why a linked list for an arp instead of an array mm. in this case um uh so the idea is uh to uh, basically, it, it really depends. 
Yeah, so uh, it can be array also. Yeah, you see here we're using actually both. We, we have array for just indexes and we have linked list for the for the node. So uh, with linked list at this, uh, at this moment, uh, what is easier is that you don't need to, if you want to maintain the order of the of the nodes, actual order from bottom to the top, yeah? You, if you have just an array, just array, let's say array semantics, yeah? So you reference, uh, reference it by index. In this case, you always need to rearrange the entire array. So if you have, like, if you need to insert node in the middle somewhere, you need to first move all other nodes. And this, how much, how many of those nodes you need to move depends on where you insert this node. Yeah, so, and uh, this will be always like different, different number. Yeah, and especially if you have there not just uh, just a node number, not just an integer, but you have like let's say two fields, you need to more or less you do it twice. Yeah, you you like change two of them. Yeah, you move two. Uh, more like more bits to move in this case and of course this uh, like uh, the advantage of the linked list over array depends on what you are doing if you are, if you don't care about velocity let's say you need only node number and you have array of like four five six elements yes in this case it can be comparable or even faster yeah, so the, it it really depends. So list linked list here used only for uh, because of this circumstance that uh, this structure that I am using there it uh, not just a, just one uh, just node number. It's also velocity. It can be something else. Yeah, it can be some additional uh, additional parameters there, and that uh, keeping it in order. Uh, is uh, like this insertion of the new element and, and insertion it on the right position and in order it's always like constant uh, constant amount of operations that's why linked list and uh, so it really depends that's why i said that uh, what i'm showing here it's uh, like a concept that you can use to do this yeah uh, and uh, the final answer probably it's uh, under uh, how understandable will be the code, how fast it will be. So benchmarking, uh, this will give you more insight into basically what what will be better for your implementation. Yeah. So that's basically uh, that's uh, that's the reason behind. Yeah, the reason behind is in this case uh, this uh, uh, sorting. Yeah, of the, of yeah. the array. Cool, thanks. And yeah, so let's say we are playing node 45 and we are starting looking for the, for the empty slot and there is no empty slot and we need to kick out someone and whom we are going to kick out the least recent node. Yeah, we see that, okay, at, uh, in the beginning of the input order array, we have index two. And so we've, this is uh, uh, the oldest node in the stack. So we want to, to remove it. So first we send node off for this node and then we just remove it. Yeah, so we uh, set it to empty and we remove this uh, uh, next previous linking. Uh, so when when we iterate now through this array, uh, through the, uh, through this list using next previous, it's more or less like invisible already. Yeah, it will just not see uh, that this node exists. So next we move actually here with input order. What's happening there? It's actually rearranging the array. Yeah, so we remove this guy and we move the entire array. Uh, one index uh, ahead and uh, next we actually insert the node and uh, next we 
before inserting the node, we actually look in through the uh, through this list, iterating by this uh, next and previous uh, references to find the node that is higher than 45 and the node that higher is 45 than it's 50 and the first node that higher than 45. Uh, so we do this link together. Yeah, so now 45 next looks to the 50, next looks to the 70, from 70 next looks to the to the sentinel, and this goes to 45 and bottom index is 2. Yeah, so it knows we know that the, the bottom node is 45, is this one. And the last one, we insert the the index of where we inserted the, this new node. That's basically how all this, I mean, that's probably the most, like the core of, of all this housekeeping in RPG Eater. That's what's what's happening there. Nothing, uh, nothing more, I would say. And yeah, uh, so in some cases, uh, if it's just a uh, node off, uh, comes in then of course no insertion happens uh, what's happening there is just what i just shown just this removal of the node yeah, so we see okay we need to remove this node we remove it from the list we change uh, references accordingly and we remove it from uh, input order also um, yeah that's it about slides and now let's look at the code, what we have here. So uh, we have, uh, it's also template. It depends on node count and uh, uh, pulses per quarter node because RPGator actually, in this case, RPGator decides the node length. So when to send node off uh, to the like uh, uh, to the send note off to the sound engine yeah so this repeating notes when to turn off the particular note this land decides arpeggiator in this case uh, it's not controllable I just hard coded it but yeah and um, again we have here this uh, constructor which uh, calculates node uh, land. That's basically what's happening here. Let's just jump to this function. Uh, where is it? Yes. So node land is calculated as if uh, pulses per quarter node is 24, then it's uh, two pulses will be. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah. Uh, otherwise it just set zero, which means that it will just send it and immediately turn it off so uh, what you will hear is uh, the release of the of the uh, of the envelope yeah so and then it says clear clear just initializes uh, initializes this uh, arrays as i just shown yeah that puts a sentinel node at the zero position and all the rest are set to to empty and here is actually the, the this method node on, which actually does what I just shown on slides. Yeah, so all this dance happening here. Uh, one thing about this is, yeah, this uh, comment that I added in the beginning. So uh, this version of Arpeggiator tolerates uh, node duplicates. Yeah, so the same node number can be repeated, like can be put inside this. Uh, array multiple times yeah so when we hear this like uh, same node repeating what happened there is actually added this amount of uh, same node yeah because we uh, in in uh, in terminal we were choosing from this like turning not choosing from the from the, uh, these ranges and of course there can be duplicate nodes in this case I tolerate this if uh, if you don't want to tolerate this you just uncomment this note off yeah so every time when you play it will first uh, make sure that the, if this note is already there it will just turn it off 
and uh, yeah so then basically this dance happening so it finds uh, looks for the empty slot if it doesn't it removes removes the node and then it uh, looks uh, for the node that is higher than uh, than the inserted one and actually what is what is interesting here is that when we look for the node that is higher we actually iterate by this next yeah so this reference yeah so we like go jump from from index to index according to the node uh, the order of the sorted order of the node but when we need just to go for empty slot uh, then we can just do something like just iterate as a as array yeah just iterate indexes which is uh, probably faster yeah in this case so we can, can do both yeah we can do this we can do that uh, at least when we iterate by indexes we can visit every node no matter if it's like inside this next previous chain or not yeah so we have like uh, two like two different views on the same same collection and we can take advantage of it um yeah then uh, if uh, we at uh, it's reassigning bottom ids if uh, in uh, the node that we are inserting is lower lowest and here happening this uh, linking uh, not linking here actually the node it's inserted so what is insertion in this case we just assign to this at this index we just assign what needs to be there and then we link yeah so next previous we do linking and uh, then we in inject this slot in the end of the input order ah uh, yeah it's not just at the end of the array there is a, a variable size yeah so what this size the size uh, depends on how many nodes are already there yeah so size minus one does it mean the end of the array it means just that some index in the end of the of the how many nodes are there because the size already gets every time gets uh, incremented on insertion and decremented on uh, removal uh, the next method is actually node off so it just looks for the uh, for the number that is what we just mm, want to to remove and then if we found something and then we call this remove node which is private function i just so here it basically does note off and then removes removes the note and removes uh, those uh, references shows again just uh, as i shown on the slides i don't want to uh, to like go actually line by line because yeah it's a lot of code here and it's probably easier to just uh, if everyone just goes through it on his own pace and if there are questions just ask on discord that would be probably the most effective way and um, yeah so this is about uh, insertion like note on and note off uh, then then we have this uh, two methods that we've seen already on terminal to register callbacks for node on and node off we will look at them uh, just in a moment how we actually register and uh, this set direction set uh, ran randomization chances input from the uh, from the uh, from knobs from the knob from one knob actually and then we have this uh, method trigger which actually called by uh, metro on every uh, every tick and uh, what's happening here uh, it uh, sends node off to the node that is like if we already at node land yeah so we we just uh, trigger it something and uh, uh, it was uh, how many two two pulses already and uh, then we uh, send note off 
at this point. And uh, uh, then what we do, we, uh, depending on the, uh, on the direction, we either go to the next node or to the previous node. Yeah, so I have these two methods, next node ID uh, index and previous node index. And how they work, now let's, let's remove this. So it, it just takes this next on, on every node. The only thing that if it sees that next is zero, which is sentinel node, it just jumps over immediately. Yeah, because there is this node, like it's not supposed to be played. Yeah, that's the only thing that it does. So it takes next, 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 jump over sentinel and, and continue. That's it. Uh, previous does the same, but looking on previous. So if you want, uh, so currently I have only two modes, yeah, like only forward and backward. Um, if uh, if uh, I need to add the S plate, then I will need this iteration to look not on the this ordered linked list, but on the uh, uh, input order, the second array that we maintain. Yeah, so there we have information about which node was entered after. Uh, after which and uh, this is basically it uh, this is just uh, just those variables so uh, note that we've seen already on the slides and we have um, uh, those are just uh, uh, constants for sentinel for empty unlinked is supposed to be set to this next and previous and variables uh, that hold um, uh, hold uh, callbacks and actually those two arrays that we were talking about and yeah some additional uh, additional um, helper uh, variables to uh, to do all this housekeeping so this is a rpg itself and so now let's look on the on the main file and see how all this stuff is put together. So I so here we instantiate actually all those guys. So scale, terminal, RPGator, uh, Metra, and Vox. Yeah, and uh, we have uh, twelve nodes, uh, city, uh, thirty-six uh, nodes uh, on the scale, and and now it's a like good uh, time to uh, say about this why it's not defined why it's not very why it's uh, actually this template why it's done like this um so if i define so first of all why it's not just local defined because this scale size let's say it's used in different uh, in different places yeah i could say that okay if i import scale uh scale header then it's already available i can use it probably for terminal but then scale uh, terminal will be will depend on scale class itself uh so it will like uh, create this like uh interconnection that is uh invisible so i don't i i could uh, like also create some global header file with global variables and use them everywhere but the problem is that I don't know where are they used. Yeah, so they are somewhere in the in the in the code. And if I change something, it and something stops working, I need to really like try to understand what 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 did I change? Yeah, what what was dependent on this variable and what happened there? So it's more about like architectural stuff. Here, I know exactly that scale depends on scale size. So it needs this guy. Terminal depends on node count and scale size. That's also like, okay, I just see it here. And RPGator depends on node size and uh, and push per quarter node. Uh, I, another information that it gives me, it um, gives me feedback about my design because like scale depends on scale size. Okay, it's okay. Yeah, it's totally fine. Terminal depends on nodes count and scale size. That's fine. It's it's what what it's supposed to know. Yeah, I mean, 
RPGator depends on, on this, yeah? So, but if my RPGator, I see here that RPGator depends on scale size, I need to put the scale size. That will be a question. Why RPGator knows about scale size? It can be a conscious decision, yeah? That, uh, let's say, currently, what does it do with randomization? It randomizes between nodes already input there, yeah? So only between the core nodes. If I want to randomize around the entire scale, I can say, okay, I need it there, yeah? But if, for instance, scale depends on pulse per quarter node, that also will be a question, what 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 does it do yeah, there? What's happening there? And uh, like doing spotty cache, for instance, I had this this case also when my trigger was dependent on, I, I just noticed that it's dependent on, on uh, uh, on the uh, how it called, <laughs> I just forgot all, all the words. Uh, on the sample rate, and it was really confusing. So, and then it turned out immediately that okay, I just put it there, something that trigger has nothing to do with. Yeah, it was just convenient at the point of writing, and I just put it there. So that basically why why I did it here this way. Yeah, to make it like clear first uh, what depends on what, uh, and also get some feedback from the system that, okay, uh, that they actually do what they more or less supposed to do. They operate on the on the values that uh, they like. It's it's okay from common sense point uh, common sense point of view to to like to be there. Yeah, so that's basically. The reason why I chose a template in this case over uh, define or global variable or something like this. That's that basically. There's um, uh, also a small question from Rowan who is asking um, if we could do ascending, descending um, arpeggiators uh, like this. I would also add, like, um, how, how would you approach it if you would want to make a much more complex? Uh, or pagiator that has all sorts of features of playing around with the notes. Would this be the approach to do that? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm afraid I'm a little bit. Uh, so what was uh, I, I, I? For me, it's a little bit hard to to. So, I so get the, 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 the it seems that the pagiator that you have now um, is playing notes in order. Yeah. Um, if you would want to make it um, ascending, descending, um... uh, but that's that's basically what it does. It plays ascending or descending. But we hear now it's not exactly ascending and descending because of the scale, how scale is mm -hmm. uh, created. So uh, currently the problem is scale. Yeah, that's why I said uh, uh, this arpeggiator. Uh, arpeggiator direction is not up and down; it's forward reverse. Yeah, because it's not exactly uh, it's it's not exactly clear. Yeah, because it, yeah, because it has more more notes than that. Yes, so yeah. this order of the this relation between note number and frequency is broken at this mm -hmm. point. That's why it seems that it's uh, placed in different direction. But in fact, what it does if you input there like frequencies will actually step uh, step up according to the note number. It will play up or down or random if you need if you need s played then you look on the second array and uh, i think that all the rest of the mod, uh, modes if there is like there are any additional modes they can be easily derived from these two uh, two arrays it's enough information to to build basically mm -hmm. But again, as I mentioned, so if you look on, on mutable instruments code, uh, there it's done opposite. Yeah, so uh, linked list used for input order and the usual array is used for like up and down. And so it's like, it's opposite there. So the way how you can do it, they are different. And uh, it depends on, uh, so I had some like particular consideration when I've done it this way. Yeah, so uh i know for instance that uh, if uh, this um this input order uh 
it's not uh, they like not intertwined so if i don't care about input order and let's say when when the stack is full and i want to throw some note i will just throw some random note or just bottom note or something like this yeah then i can take this array and all the operations with this array and just throw them out i just don't need them they are not they are completely like two parallel uh, parallel data structure they they don't uh, depend on each other too much so that was one of the consideration uh, to do this also for me it was like convenient to have this backward forward yeah so it's uh, this uh, previous and next uh, for instance it comes of course it comes at expense of additional if you have 16 nodes it's uh, like additional 16 bytes of the of the code size because you need in every node you have additional reference and it's uh, uh, u int 8 so you have uh, you have additional uh, this additional 16 bytes there so uh, but again, for for like when I design it, I see it like a convenient. Yeah, so I know that this is forward, this is backward, and I don't. I I just it just defined by the model. So yeah, that's, yeah. Um, that's basically. Is it, is it also now as played because of the way? No, no, no. no. Currently, no. But if if there w would be uh, this mode. I mean, it was just uh, I have to somehow modify controls and then uh, in this trigger, what I will do, I will instead of looking on on this on direction, I will look on this uh, input order, uh, input order array and just go through it one by one from zero to because it actually mm -hmm, yeah. con contains it in order that that is needed. Yeah, so that's basically. Uh, pretty easy to do yes it's additional additional condition inside trigger to look on the uh, another array yeah and that's it um ben ben is asking uh, another question um uh, how how do you go about testing these individual classes during development any unit tests are you running code locally or flashing it uh, to the uh, daisy let me, and using let me, the let me just uh, let me just show you quickly what's happening yeah this is xcode i'm on mac so it's uh, it's uh, id for ios development for uh, for mac development watch os development so all those developments is actually development in general yeah so yeah because these uh, three classes rpgator scale and terminal they are not dependent on anything in daisy duino actually uh, it's not exactly true sorry there is one dependency that i uh, that i uh, commented out i guess it's in terminal um yeah so a random that i'm using there so that's that random mm, let me return to terminal yeah this random it's not uh, not available there yeah so uh, i just said the 127 uh, but otherwise uh, yeah that's that's how i actually not just tested i developed it like this yeah so of course it's way easier to just run it and have uh, so in my on arp node on and note off i have just prints that print me into console what I what I'm getting as an output and I just just go and yeah so I just run it and it immediately shows me okay if if the order is right what 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 goes after what and and all this stuff so that's that's how it it could be also put of course behind unit testing so instead of just looking on the console output I could set here some uh, conditions that if node equals this and it's okay otherwise please crash and tell me that something is wrong then it would be um, like a unit of testing but to do this yeah that's also part of the of the intent of this separation of those classes that i can just take them outside of the arduino and just work with them and it's way faster of course 
because uh, this uh, guy compiles uh, much faster. I don't know if it, yeah, it's already succeeded. Yeah. So this is way faster than changing something and then uh, then doing like uh, flashing it and uh, trying to somehow print it or something. Here I can also put a breakpoint. So everything everything at my disposal. Yeah, I, I can do whatever whatever I need. And uh, also it has really great code completion. And yeah, as long as uh, those classes stand uh, inside the standard uh, C++ and C, yeah, everything is fine. So and uh, so after that, I just take it, copy it there, or I can just reference it directly from there, and that's it. So that's that's how I'm uh, that's how I'm actually developing this, because in Arduino mm -hmm. it's uh, a little bit hard to to for me at least it's a little bit hard to work with uh, like more complex code yeah, than yeah. Ben Ben is saying that he's nodding vigorously. Um, yeah, he's also asking, uh, uh, did you reach for the linked list uh, faster data structure after seeing performance issues or was that a design choice ahead of time? No, it was actually a design, uh, design choice. So I, I was thinking about uh, actually what, uh, so when I, when I realized uh, actually, uh, okay, I want to build arpeggiator, what do I need there? I need to maintain this, I need to do something that. And then I start thinking, okay, how can I do this, this, uh, this thing, this thing? Uh, and I was uh, actually looking around. As, and again, as I said, I just caught this idea that linked list can be used for this in the uh, in uh, uh, in that uh, mutable instruments code. And I thought, okay, I want to try it. And yeah, I just. Uh, more or less build it my way how how I would build it and uh, yeah so it was just a design decision uh, I didn't uh, try to build another version with just an array and bench benchmark against it so I can imagine again that this benchmark will really depend on the amount of nodes there because for small amount of nodes probably array will beat it um, but yeah, so basically I wanted to explore uh, this concept of using this guy and using uh, just an array. So the, I just gave it a go in this case. Yeah, and I wanted also to, to show you this possibility that it's kind of possible to do it also this way. Mm -hmm. um, Rowan is asking if there is a way to abstract the Arduino random function. He was having difficulty trying to generate random numbers when not using Arduino, Daisy Duino, using libdaisy with uh, just C++ code? Uh, I guess this uh, it's easier to just use built-in random function then, or just just use some standard, uh, standard functions, because standard functions will work with Arduino, I suspect. I didn't try, but I, I would suspect they, they will. Uh, but yeah, opposite, of course, it's kind of, yeah, you will need to import it. So I would say it's, uh, I would probably not even abstract it, but just, just use standards and in place. Uh, okay. They are convenient. I mean, the, what you have in Arduino, they cool. have convenience in text. Um, we're getting close to one hour and a half. Um, if people have any further questions, please drop them down, um, in. Um, in the chat. Um, yeah, Vlad, uh, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, probably a couple of, yeah, today we have a lot of stuff to talk about. So, oh, and, yeah. and also please everyone, um, uh, like this um, while you watch it, that's really useful. Uh, and uh, if you can comment afterwards when the uh, stream is done, if you can just add a comment, that would be really appreciated. Thank you. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, what's what's happening next is uh, just a setup of the of the frequency uh, for the uh, for metro, 
Yeah, so the minimum BPM is 40, range is 200, which means that we are going from 40 to 240. Um, and then I just calculate uh, some constants. So I don't do like, don't repeat the same calculation over and over again uh, to you. And then I use those uh, like minimum frequency and uh, frequency range like later here in the in the loop function yeah here um yeah so uh, what's happening here it's actually those callbacks defined so pretty similar to what you have for audio callback it's just a function uh saying that okay on terminal node on please do rpgator node on set the, this number and velocity on note off, please arpeggiator note off. I, I also talking about callbacks. Uh, callback is, uh, of course, uh, more expensive than direct function call. Yeah, because you at least need to to get the pointer to the function and to uh, and then you can call this function. Um, how I go usually about this? Uh, I do like design first. Yeah, so. If I designed it this way and it and I don't see performance issues, it's totally fine. From the other side, if uh, in in this case with this syntax, for me it's way easier to uh, way easier to understand what's what's a co my connection. Yeah, so I see I can read it as a sentence. Yeah, on terminal node on arpeggiator node on, and it's easier to understand what's going to happen at which uh, at which point of time. Uh, also, um, if I do it like another way around, uh, I mean, just with some uh, direct calls or just uh, checking for the, I need then in arpeggiator, let's say, maintain some internal state that, okay, now it's this node, then this node goes away. And yeah, can be, can be also an option, but in this case, I don't, uh, I'm not sure that there will be like performance gain if we're talking about performance. So, and uh, on the other side, if you see if there are any bottlenecks in the in the performance, uh, because all everything is like designed like this, yeah, it's separated. It's I see clearly where my connections are, how they work, how they call. It's way easier than to like try to find where where this bottleneck is. Yeah, I can like actually disable module by module. Uh, reconnect them differently yeah? so i can disconnect arpeggiator let's say again if i have uh, uh, polyphonic sound engine and just connect directly and see okay now performance is fine okay it's fine then arpeggiator does something yeah so i then i can look into the arpeggiator so uh first usually what i do i do like uh design and then if I see that something, something like I need to improve performance, then comes uh, some kind of uh, optimizations, and maybe at this point will be okay. This one uh, callback call actually can save uh, all the all the performance, and I will probably replace it with something else. Uh, so we set up these functions here. Uh, then audio callback is really simple. Yeah, if it's plain and metro process, it's actually at which uh, when metro generates this tick, it uh, triggers uh, arpeggiator, and then we just take locks. And yeah, then comes setup. I initialize locks with sample rate. It depends on it. I initialize metro with uh, like basic um, uh, with some frequency. Uh, then I actually register those callbacks here and set pin mode to the to the switch. Yeah, and one more thing here, this analog resolution, analog read resolution, what I'm doing, I'm uh, scaling it down. So by default, Daisy has, uh, Daisy Duino does uh, 10, um, 10 bits resolution, which uh, gives uh, up to 1023. Uh, output on knobs i set it to seven bits which gives uh, up to 127 
because in this case, I don't need this some really smooth changes on something. Yeah, I operate on really like discrete, discrete stuff. From the other side, uh, because knobs works like a selectors. Yeah, so when I turn this terminal knob, it actually selects. I don't want there. Um, I don't need this jitter there. Yeah, and the the lower resolution, so from zero twenty seven, one hundred twenty seven, the jitter will be uh, less of the value, and so it's also uh, easier in this case. And uh, this uh, property is uh, knob max. It's actually depending on analog resolution. Uh, calculates me what to expect yeah so also I can use it then through my code so here I'm div divided not by 127 by but by this uh, variable and what I know that uh, if I change here to like 10 all my code will continue working because everything will change yeah so all my ratios will change accordingly so everything will be fine there I don't need to to keep in it in mind, yeah, that something something is there. So it's again the same thing as those templates to offload as much as possible to the code. Yes, yeah, so that it's like it keeps uh, it knows what what to do. You don't need to. You don't want to remember all this stuff. You want to do something more creative. And yeah, so a loop uh, is pretty simple then. Yeah, so uh, we read uh, switch and knobs. We set metro frequency. We set this offset on the terminal, which select different nodes. And then a little bit of trickery here to uh, do this uh, double mode of the uh, uh, knob uh, that controls the behavior of the arpeggiator. So, uh, instead of setting it just random or not, I increase this random, uh, randomness gradually. So uh, till the half of the half half of the term, the randomization chance increases to maximum, and then after the half turn, it decreases to minimum. But also at the half of the turn, uh, direction changes from uh, forward to backward. So. And because it's like covered by this randomization, this switch is just uh, it's not noticeable, which which I like a lot. Um, yeah, so uh, that's uh, probably it. Um, it's already a lot of a lot of stuff, I guess. Uh, a lot of. Uh, different details so if you have more questions please yeah uh, yeah okay so gonna walk to this um, yeah so uh, one last question coming from Rowan about uh, inspiration from uh, for for synth design um, in general when when you come up with ideas um, for an instrument uh, or when you think about um, the separations of different functionalities to knobs and controllers um, how do you how do you approach this um, well if it's uh, first of all it's it doesn't happen just just uh, do overnight it once. Uh, yeah just do it once yeah just uh, so in uh, if, if if I would ex uh, tell you, the like the entire path of this particular code how it evolved and what parts were there and what uh it it was something completely different in the beginning uh, so uh, i guess it's uh, mostly by uh like sometimes so for, for this particular case i was looking just at uh, arpeggiator plugins so I look at arpeggiator plugin. Okay, what does it do? It, do, it does this, 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 this. Okay, then the rest should go somewhere else. And so somehow, like, uh, um, so it's just about looking, and probably mostly it's about like actually trying to do this. The more you do this, you the better you get in it. Uh, so. A lot of work, I guess, should be done with uh, paper and pencil. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, I've 
also find myself pretty often in the position when I just trying to get through some algorithm to make it work or something like this. And I'm forgetting about like separation or something like this, but still it's, uh, like it, it's just an, uh, just conscious effort to, to like start thinking about it. And if you start thinking about it, if you give your, or like give your brain the task to think about it, you will come up with these ideas. And again, there is no right or wrong way to do this. Yeah, this this is how I've done it. If you look on other code, you will see a little bit different separation there. So it's like, it's really, uh, really creative process. Where That's where the fun probably is actually, to, to see how all this can yeah. be done. I'll also add here um, a note and give you guys a challenge. Um, one of the main things uh, that I see as a teacher, that is a huge difference between people who study at the academy. Um, so if you don't know, I, I, I'm an academic teacher. I teach um, at the Design Academy in Eindhoven. Um, the main difference that we have when we stop studying is that there is no deadline. And when there's no deadline, it's very hard to commit to something because Vlad and I have these deadlines. Like we know we're going to be releasing an instrument or we're going to do a workshop. It like, there's a shift in the brain that like, okay, I need to figure this out. I need to come up with ideas now. Um, inspiration comes from all sorts of places. It can be from a conversation. It could be from, um, looking at something concrete that's working. Um, or if you're like uh, Stein from, uh, this is not rocket science, it's probably going to be coming from physics. Um, it can come from anywhere, but if you have a very clear like deadline, this needs to be released here. And it could be something fake that you just came up for uh, with on your own. Um, you'd be surprised how effective this can be. Um, and with that, I'm going to give you guys a challenge. We talked about it last uh, last week. Um, and we're going to try to make this into a regular thing and I'll make sure to make notes and remind myself to talk about this at the beginning of the chat, uh, of the, of the lesson and not at the end. Um, but the, the challenge is simple. Every week when we have these lessons, we're going to give you a challenge to design something with the knowledge that you received. The code is on GitHub, um, and you can play around and come up with your own ideas. These ideas, when they're ready, you can uh, drop them on Discord and um, tag me and Vlad and say that you made this thing. At the moment, there is no particular channel for this, but we are there, so you can just tag either me or Vlad or both. Um, and then we're going to show them at the beginning of the next lesson. So I think that's going to be quite interesting to see what people can come up with. Uh, I would also add to this uh, you don't necessarily have to program the, your ideas. Um, many times, especially for me that I'm coming from product design rather than engineering, um, the design is actually in VCV rack. And I would communicate with an engineer with a VCV rack patch. And I would say, okay, so like, this is how it would work. And here's like a macro control of all the uh, knobs that, or switches that I need. And then we would figure out the engineering side of it or the programming side later on. So feel free to also suggest ideas and designs that you came up with that are not necessarily inside of Arduino, um, but just using whatever platform or tool that you're uh, familiar with uh, and just suggesting an idea and showing what you came up with. So it's more on the design side. Um, yeah, um, more and more questions, anyone? Any uh, questions on the on the challenge? Uh, also feel free to, to ask on Discord. Uh, again, we're always available there. Um, if uh, there are no questions, uh, Vlad, do you have any anything else to add? Um, no, I would probably also only say thank you for, for being with us. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's always nice to, to, to run these because it feels more uh, like on Discord, we sort of like see everyone like this, but it's, sort of, it's only chat and now it's a bit more like it feels like we could actually 
uh, yeah. bring more people to to the stage, uh, even if it's in the chat, but also for uh, professionals like uh, like Flood to bring more people. Um, and it's not only me on on videos. I feel like it becomes more of a of a community thing. Um, again, if you want to support, the first thing to do is to just uh, like and comment on on these videos. Um, that's always useful. Um, if you want to support financially, you can just buy one of the kits or boards. Um, if you do that, um, well, now basically, <laughs> on the 29th, then uh, my partner is still um, uh, in Rotterdam. I'm already abroad, but she's still in Rotterdam, so she's going to ship it um, uh, tomorrow. Um, and if not, then we're going to be back uh, shipping products um, from the 20th of uh, of august so we're going to take a bit of a break um and thanks again for uh, uh for joining us we'll see you guys uh, i don't see that there are any questions so we'll see you guys uh on on discord and next week on uh not next week but the week after so on monday not this monday but the week after we're going to have a workshop with nick donaldson from infrasonic audio it's going to be um we're going to explore the drums uh, examples on the daisy um, for me that's really interesting because i'm coming from hacking so i always like just i open an example and i play around with it and see what happens um, but we're actually going to do it with nick who is a professional dsp engineer so that's going to be very interesting um, um, and um, yeah it's it's different each of these workshops takes a bit of a different approach so um, yeah, I hope you appreciate the, the variety. And if you have any suggestions, again, feel free to share them. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment. And we'll see you on Discord. Ciao. Thank you. Bye.